Thank you for joining us for Health Talks. I'm Gail Hogan, and Dr. Alex Kim is here to share the latest news on HIPEC, a regional chemotherapy delivery method, and what that means for patients. Thank you, Dr. Kim, for being here. No, thanks for having me. And can you explain what is HIPEC? Yeah, HIPEC is an acronym. It stands for Hyperthermic Intraperitoneal Chemo Perfusion or Chemotherapy. It's just a, a you know complex way of saying heated chemo bath delivered to the belly cavity for patients that are afflicted with cancer that is isolated to the perineal cavity or the belly cavity. And when you say chemo bath, what does that mean? So we uh, utilizing some tubings and and in the, inside the operating room, we basically deliver heated chemo bath directly into the belly cavity, and we circulate using a perfusion machine to allow for the chemo to circulate and maintain the temperature and treating to the patient to kill the, uh, the cancer cells that are isolated within the belly cavity. So this HIPEC is used only for, you know, as you say, in the stomach area, in the belly area? Yeah, so we, if you think about in terms of the belly cavity as almost like a boiler room, okay? So the uh, cancers in the GI tract, it, it, think about it like this. It's starting out inside the pipe, for example, like an erosion in the pipe and that result in contamination in the boiler room, right? And basically the job of HIPEC or also um, the cyroreductive surgery, which we'll talk about, is a tube compartment or two uh, operations that's kind of combined into one, is to clean up the contamination from the tumor cells in the belly cavity or in the boiler room, and then also utilize the chemo bath to basically clean up all the cancer cells that may be floating around that is not visible by eye. You, you mentioned, I'm going to say this, say it the wrong way, chyto, yeah. cytoreductive surgery. Is you that said correct? it perfectly. Okay. Yeah. Can you explain? Yeah. So, cytoreductive surgery, it's also another fancy way <laughs> of saying, because we assign fancy terminology to surgical procedures. It's basically uh, removal or resection of cancer um, that is visible by eye. So it could be potentially just removing the tumor that might be an implant inside the belly cavity, or sometimes they're inherently attached to like intestines and then we, sometimes we have to take a portion of that intestine out to remove it. But encompassing term cyroreductive surgery means that we're clearing of the belly cavity of the cancer that we could see with our with our eyes. So cytoreductive surgery and HIPEC work together? They work together, yeah. It's a two-part surgery, actually. So it's actually three parts if you think about it, because when we start the operation, the first phase always in any surgical procedure is to assess, meaning how much disease is there? Are we, is this a safe environment for us to proceed with the rest of the surgery? So it's always the exploratory phase, that's number one. And number two, once the, the criteria are met, meaning it could be safely removed, and being safely removed, me meaning it's safe for the patient and quality of life and so on and so forth, but also ensuring that we're gonna achieve that best oncologic outcome or the cancer-based outcome, meaning we're gonna be taking that cancer out safely. Then we proceed with cytoreductive surgery. Um, that's one part of the operation that takes the longest because we're meticulously removing all sorts of tumor implants, which could be anywhere between half a centimeter all the way up to a couple centimeters. And it could require what we call multivisceral resection or removal of certain organs. Um, and um, those organs could be intestines, portions of the liver, portions of the diaphragm, and then the lining of the, the belly cavity. And then once that is done, and then we're ensuring that there is no disease left by our eyes, then we bathe the belly cavity with the heated chemo bath. Because the concept is this, the cancer rises from something that you can't see. Mm -hmm. And as they multiply and divide and produce and reproduce, they start to form plaques or nodules or masses that you could see with your eyes. So if somebody had cancer or masses or belly, you know, within their belly cavity, it had to come from microscopic disease. So the, th the premise of the HIPEC is that cyroreductive surgery will take care of macroscopic disease or disease that we could see with our own eyes. And the second portion of the operation or the third portion of the operation, HIPEC, is to clear any microscopic disease that may be left behind. Are there any specific cancers in the stomach area that this works best for? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So there are particularly certain GI tract cancers, but also uh, gynecologic cancers. I'm not gonna discuss in terms of the gynecologic cancers today, but the GI tract cancers, such as cancers arising from the appendix, colorectum, and as well as what we call mesothelioma, which is a lining of the belly cavity, those are, those are some of the cancers that we employ cytoreductive surgery and HIPEC procedure because it's been shown and demonstrated to be efficacious. So besides a specific cancer that this works best on, what other, um, what other type of patient would be you know, the best candidate for this type of procedure? Yeah, absolutely. So number one, with any operation, you have to be fit for surgery. So you, know, you have to have 
um, diseases that you may have to be well controlled, whether it be cardiovascular, pulmonary disease, um, you got to be in good performance shape. This is a big, big operation. Mm -hmm. It puts a lot of stress on, on, on a patient. So they have to come in with good nutritional status, good performance status, meaning they're able to walk at least a block, walk up and down stairs without losing stamina. And good nutrition status, I mentioned, you know, good um, heart healthy diet with good protein source. And, um, and uh, in terms of the candidacy, it's a little bit complicated because what we typically see is patients that come in uh, with metastatic disease. And foremost, um, what we have to do is make sure that the metastases that's within the belly doesn't travel to other parts of the body. So we get these patients actually started on IV or systemic chemotherapy first. It's two, two thoughts. Number one is to treat the patient as a whole because if there are small things that are floating around, it could be floating around your, uh, in your bloodstream that could get um, uh, metastasized or travel to other parts of the body. The other thought is that we're basically utilizing chemo to put a fence around the belly cavity so that it doesn't get out. So those are the two ways. Now, when the patient is on chemotherapy, they're typically treated for six months at a time. And every three months we assess whether they are getting worse or they're stable or actually they're improving in terms of their cancer volume. And the candidacy for the cyroductive surgery depends on what we call a peritoneal carcinomatosis index, which is actually an assessment of the volume of disease. Because that number that's assigned as a low, moderate, or high, there it's designated with patient pro prognosis and outcomes also. So for example, for patients that have appendiceal or colorectal cancer metastases that have high volume disease, those patients unfortunately are unlikely to make it to the cyroductive surgery or HIPEC. But for patients that have low to moderate volume disease that are responding or stable on chemotherapy, those are perfect candidates. What advantages are there uh, to the patient for this? Obviously, y you talked about different ways of getting to this. So it's you know, you're, you're working many different ways to reach an end result. Yeah, is absolutely. The, is that what's best for the patient? I think so, for the, especially the, for the patients that are candidate for right. the surgical portion right. of it. Um, because in our field, we actually have taken a look at the data. In patients particularly, um, and I'm going to discuss the colorectal cancer because that's where most of the data is coming from. When patients that have uh, peritoneal metastases receive zero treatment, meaning no chemotherapy or no surgery. Their median overall survival is about six to eight months, unfortunately. With the best systemic chemotherapy option, and we looked at this data too, nationally as well as international data by various different authors, um, their improvement in survival is demonstrated, but it's only by 16 months for their median overall survival. So you could see there it's a devastating consequences. Right. However, with the most recent trial that was performed in France, which is a phase three trial examining chemotherapy, cyroductive surgery, plus or minus high pec, what we're actually starting to see is benefit of over median overall survival going from 16 months to 42 months. So it's a significant leap. So for patients that are able to undergo operation, meaning they're good performance status, they're a good surgical candidate, they have appropriate volume of disease, and they're not progressing on chemotherapy, the multimodal therapy, meaning combination of IV chemotherapy plus cyroductive surgery plus or minus HIPEC is the best way to go. You mentioned that these folks have to be in the best shape. Mm -hmm. It's a major operation. Yes. What about recovery? Recovery, that's a great question too. So bigger operations, unfortunately, and e even despite the fact that it's 2023, bigger operations do have bigger risks. And there are morbidities associated with um, these type of operations. Our national uh, complication rate that we oftentimes quote as cyroductive surgeons is about 20% all-comer complications, which means a minor complication such as a wound infection all the way to a blood clot traveling to the lungs or a heart attack, it's about 20% nationally. Um, we, because of our hard work and our comprehensive multidisciplinary team and our dedication to the care for our patients at Ohio State, our rates are much lower than that. It's actually about 5%. And, and we're very proud uh, of our complication rates and how we take care of our patients in a very safe, very safe manner. Even though a patient may be optimum for this type of surgery, mm -hmm. do you look at how advanced the cancer is before deciding whether this is worth it for them? Oh, absolutely, yeah. So this is where we, you know, we discuss in terms of the IV chemotherapy comes in handy. While they're on systemic chemotherapy, preceding the surgery, right. we assess them every three months by CT scan just to make sure that the disease isn't getting worse. 
And um, what we're looking for is while on systemic chemotherapy, their disease is being st is stable, if not responding, but we definitely don't wanna see what we call progression or worsening. That means the surgery, unfortunately, is not gonna be able to control their disease because of the aggressiveness that they see. Not only that, we talked about what we call the peritoneal carcinomatosis index or the volume. Um, the volume definitely matters in terms of whether there will be a surgical candidate or not because high volume disease, we've shown that um, despite uh, the fact that we may be able to remove all uh, the disease, their recurrence rates are higher and their overall prognosis is worse. So there's a certain cutoff that we utilize for high volume patients that we say, you know what, unfortunately the surgery is not gonna be helpful in this setting. And then also, um, location of the metastases or the disease that's um, located in the belly cavity is also important too because you could have a low volume disease but if it's in an inopportune spot where we can't mm. safely remove it right. and unfortunately we can't perform surgeries in those uh, scenarios. So you do have a lot of things to discuss with patients. It's a very complicated process and it's a very uh, comprehensive um, review process and assessment for the patient so that they get the best oncologic outcome without uh, the risks associated with it. After you explain what a patient has to go through in yeah. order to get to the, the high back surgery, are there some that say, no, not for me, give me traditional chemo? Yeah, there are some patients that actually elect for that. And you know, their understanding of the risks and the benefits that are presented you know, regarding what we call multimodal therapy, which is a combination of systemic chemotherapy in addition to surgical resection. Obviously, we discuss in terms of the risks and the morbidity that could be associated with surgery, despite the fact that OSU being one of the very, very small um, uh, morbidity written centers, our complication rates are very low. However, some patients just are not comfortable with that, and we have to be accepting of that too. Yeah, and it, you know, we uh, definitely consider into our calculation when we're actually delivering treatment options to the patient what they're desiring, what their goals are, and how they want to handle and care, uh, ca uh, take care for their cancer. So it's, it's absolutely an important aspect to be considering. When you talk to patients about this surgery, what do you want them to know about HIPEC? I think the most important thing is the recognition about being cared by a multidisciplinary team, meaning the specialists that are going to be taking care of you, not just about the, the, the procedure itself, but who is, who is your team that you're surrounded by, the medical oncologist, the pathologist, the surgical oncologist, um, the advanced providers, as well as your social workers, and, and so on and so forth. So uh, when you consider in terms of surgical resections, we oftentimes focus on um, the surgery itself and, and how that's going to relate to the patient. But I think it's important that uh, the patients see what we offer at Ohio State, meaning multidisciplinary care, and how each specialist is dedicated in terms of the best outcome that the patient could have. What other type of therapies <clears throat> like this exist um, that you utilize at the James? Is there anything like this? Absolutely. So. Um, the cyroductive surgery in HIPEC is what we uh, call regional therapies. It's an umbrella term that we utilize to say certain cancers are isolated to very specific compartments. And compartments meaning, for example, the belly cavity or the liver or the lung. And we call those individual areas the compartment. And we have the capacity to do just specifically local regional delivery of chemotherapy or targeted therapies of surgical resections. Uh, particularly in the liver, we have a, a program called the Hepatic Artery Infusion Pump Program. And it applies for actually patients that have colorectal cancers that have traveled to the liver. Mm. And basically what we do is we surgically implant a pump that sits uh, just like a port would for patients that are getting IV chemotherapy under the skin. And the catheter gets placed at a uh, artery um, that allows for the, for the chemo to be delivered directly into the liver. And the chemotherapy agent that we use is a derivative of a common chemotherapy that we use for colorectal cancer called FUDR. It's a derivative of fluorouracil or 5-FU. Uh, fortunately, we're able to give, for this premise or the hepatic artery infusion pump program, uh, we're able to deliver the chemotherapy at a, at a level 400 times the concentration that will be normally tolerated body wow. without the added side effect that you would normally experience by giving the chemotherapy through the IV. Well, you look at quality of life for a patient. <clears throat> so do you take all that into consideration when you're looking at Absolutely. all the ways to treat these folks for the colorectal cancer? Absolutely. Quality of life, but not only that, you know, what's coming to be known is what we call financial toxicity, right? Socioeconomic toxicity, mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. So the cancer doesn't only affect an individual's body, but also, you know, in terms of their financial support, their socioeconomic support, their 
their emotional support and so on and so forth. So their I, efficacy, family, who's helping? Absolutely, right. absolutely. Who's going to be driving them to right. their appointments? Who's going to be taking care of them after an operation or their therapies? And who's going to be looking out for them when they get sick at night? You know, from the chemotherapy. So I think it's important not to just look at the um, the cancer as a disease entity on its own, but I think you have to look at the patient as a whole and be mindful about how certain therapies could be effectively delivered without causing these, you know, these risks or toxicities. Let's focus on research. You have a lab. What kind of stuff are you working on? Yeah, this, this, is, this is my passion. So um, I have a uh, basic science or translational research lab. So predominantly what we do in my lab is we do molecular or molecular biology or genetics. And what we're actually researching is the way, to find out the way in which the colorectal cancer travels to different parts of the body and how it does that so that we could target those factors better. And uh, specifically in my lab, we research in terms of how uh, specific gene uh, regulation or gene expression under the control of certain proteins allow for colorectal cancer to travel to the peritoneum and how that causes for worsening of disease but more importantly, looking at in terms of chemo resistance. And currently it's unpublished data, but we have identified a factor that we think is specific for colorectal cancer peritoneal metastases. And we have identified a downstream target gene, which we think is responsible for the resistance to the chemotherapy that we're often seeing in these patients. So can you direct it before it goes to one of these organs, if that's what your research shows that it more often would go to lung, as you said, or maybe yeah. to liver. Can you treat those before you even see anything? Hopefully, that would be the you know that would be the best case scenario. Right now, what we're trying to see is based on those factors that we know, how do we mitigate and how do we optimize our therapy so that you know utilizing the current therapy that's already approved and you being utilized in colorectal cancer patients could better be utilized so that we could enhance their overall prognosis. What do you see in the future? In the future, I hope that you know we conquer colorectal cancer, and particularly, it's it's very pressing uh, times because we're having more younger patients um, be diagnosed with colorectal cancer um, under the age of 45, and hence why the United States uh, Task Force has reduced the age of screening colonoscopy from 50 to 45, and oftentimes these patients, unfortunately, are presenting with more metastatic disease. Um, so with research, better patient care, better um, uh, options for treatments, we're hoping to conquer uh, colorectal cancer so that uh, you know, we could provide better life for all these patients. Great work you're doing, Dr. Kim. Thank you so much for Thanks joining for us. Me. Yeah. And thank you for joining us for Health Talks.